Don't most doctors uh, make a living? Um, huh? Don't most doctors and lawyers make a, make a living? And they, was, uh, they must all have good merit? Uh, well, I wonder if it depends where and when. Lawyers, for example, in Israel, many of them don't make a living. Many lawyers, they do all the law exams and they went into other trades or professions because there is too many, too many lawyers, there's more supply than demand for lawyers in Israel. Mm. Because I suppose there, <laughs> most people with in America also, and in America there are many lawyers with a law degree, and they don't find it so. <laughs> so there's the overcrowded stuff. Now, um, uh, so it's first, I'd just to conclude the important explanation here of uh, what it says, what it says here in the, the Mishnah. In the name of Rabbi Meir, a person always teach his son all his new key of a color, and you should pray to one who possesses all the wealth and property in the world, because any trade or profession has either, has uh, it can be bring in wealth and bring great poverty. A qualified chuto. What is according to Zuchut? So we discussed this at length now what Zuchut means. So the Tiferet the, uh, Yisrael says, to explain this mission of Rabbi Meir, it means that you should do his tarot, which is apparently the simple meaning of this mission is that the person should adopt some form of an um. So therefore a parent's got to give his, his son the preparation to be able to make a living. But it's got to be color, it's got to be not too heavy, and it's got to be also pure. If we explain purity means two angles. Purity, which is the dis previous discussion, it shouldn't involve too much uh, uh, possibilities of connection with the opposite sex, which could bring a person to have new thoughts. And the second aspect is it should be honest in every respect and shouldn't lead the person to go and uh, deceive others, swindle others. And one of the reasons it's got to be color is also because there is a principle with all humanut all work that a person does, it says, a person should always have a situation expressed in many places. In the words of Hazal, In other words, he's got to make sure that's also in the Russian Hazal, your main discussion has got to be learning Torah teaching Torah. And the melacha you do should be temporary, should be more of a temporary situation, because in any case, physical life is temporary. And we know with Torah, in fact, it's expressed clearly in the brachot we say, we say, chai olamna, tzapetocheno. Torah brings eternity. And a person should make the main object of his life to fulfill mitzvot and to learn Torah. Fill a mitzvah is also part of Kodesh. But to go and engage in a livelihood is a secondary consideration. And that's why it's got to be color. So these are the words of Tiferet Yisrael, if you've got them in front of you. He says, Hishtad Lot is necessary, but he should not believe that his efforts will produce wealth. In other words, he's got to have two other things. In this concept of that we explained yesterday, there are two things. One is, to pursue saintliness. A person, Yahweh, you've got to give the weapon of doing righteous deeds and thinking of Torah. 
you should pray to HaKadosh Baruch Hu to take away from him any aspect that will prevent him making ends meet. As the person's got to say to Hashem, please help me with the work I've undertaken, which is my business or my trade, that it should be successful. But he should not think, this, this is a very important point, should not think, because of my 100% tefillah, the Kodesh is going to change what's predetermined. Let's go together what we discussed yesterday, that really is predetermined what's going to be rich or poor. So you shouldn't think, okay, I'm going to pray a lot, and even my decree in heaven is I'm going to be a poor man. Surely through my prayer, it'll change. No, prayer doesn't change. Prayer alone will not change it. This says, Vatibi Hasib. What has been, see, predeterminism is a double concept even today. There's theological predeterminism and the scientific predeterminism. And most of the uh, academics in the world and their publications, they deal with the, the what's in sociology and many psychologists also. They think the law of causality, which applies in, in, in the robot nature, which we see around us in the mineral world, even the animal world, also applies to the human world. And this person can't really change anything from the point of view of the natural sources of behavior. So it's predetermined through nature and nurture. Or theological means Hashem decides right at the beginning, before a person's born, and then makes a new decision every Rosh Hashanah, what amount a person is going to have wealth or poverty, and health and sickness. So he says, if a person thinks, oh, my tefillah, I just have to Hashem, and whatever, if, if it be turned by Shamayim, that I should be poor, surely through my tefillah, I tell these people, come on, oh, I've done so well today, so certainly that's going to bring success. I went all around the Kivrit Tzadik and went and said all the tefillahs, and say for I said during the year a thousand times, that of course Hashem has to listen to me, so I can't be poor. No, not so, not so. That's called Iyun Tefillah. If a person thinks my Tefillah, it says here, Iyun Tefillah alone will not help. Because, he says, it's dangerous. Because if a person thinks, I'm putting all the effort into Tefillah, and then it doesn't become fulfilled, then after we say, I no longer believe in divine providence. And in fact, I'll tell you what, I'll tell you the story that happened to me. <laughs> that was told to me. When I first wanted to start the yeshiva, so I went round to Gedolim to discuss it. So I went to Rav Hutt and was one of the great Gedolim in, in Jewish outlook. So, so uh, I told him about the yeshiva. And so he told me the following, uh, because I spoke with Lubavitch, Lubavitch is the biggest kid of the movement. I told him also what Lubavitch had ever told me, now he sent it, how he was pleased with this program. So he said that when he was young, he even was able to learn a bit Chavrusa with the Lubavitch era before he became the Rebbe. So he learned Chavrusa with him. And when did he, because he was, uh, had a very, very background. He had, he had a background from uh, the Lubavitch era, and another background from Rav Kook also. Then afterwards he, you know, he then he constructed with Maral, and you know, it was one of the great Pachat Yitzchok, he got to a big yeshiva, Pachat Yitzchok, nearby, that's after the name of Rabitzo Kutner. So I also want to tell you, when you started the yeshiva, we had this course to be able to take the Talmidim to Rav Hutner to ask any questions. And that's this very interesting session. Now I want to tell you about this matter, because he told me this has to do with Iwan Tefillo. He said to me, how did he leave Lubavitch and went elsewhere? Because uh, uh, I don't know if the Rebbe himself, or one of his shlichem, maybe the Rebbe himself, the big businessman, and, uh, and uh, he, he promised the big, big businessman, if you keep Shabbos, because he wasn't often but it was part of Shabbos, if you keep Shabbos, it's Hashem, if you keep Shabbos properly, then the ruler will come. You'll see. You'll see. Mashiach will come already. Because we, all need, we need every Chal of Shabbos to know. See, Peter Lee, sure, you've got your part to, to, to strengthen Shabbos. So the Mashiach didn't come. And therefore, this businessman said, well, it didn't come, so I'm, I'm, I'm back to keep my factories open on Shabbos. That happens to some simple people, they think in that fashion. So that's also something that I say so many tefillahs, so surely I'll become rich. No, that's called even tefillah, 
And even to feel it, the Mordor says, is one of the things which will, which will mask it upon the tough shall have done. Then it, it reminds Hashem of all his sins. You think you're special and you're going to change the divine decree. Let's first examine your own deeds. Are your deeds good enough? But the only thing that can change, yes, tefillah helps, but tefillah's got to be with teshuva. So it's very important to be, you've got others, you've got to change. If you want your tefillah to help, you've got to change hakolafi zechuto. That's the deeper meaning here of zechut. You've got to change inside. It's no good saying words and words and words, that's lip service. You, even if it, even it reaches your heart, it's been in your heart, but it's, it's got to be in action as well. You've got to actually change. When a person, because that's hakolafi mazalo, even even his effort at earning a living, a person, but let's take the example we quoted before, a person wants to be a lawyer here in Israel, also in some areas in America, and he can't get a job. He say, look, I, I studied six years to become a top lawyer, and I've got all the qualifications, but there's so much competition, I couldn't get a job anywhere. So what am I going to do? Would have changed, you know, it's very difficult. Yeah, so you can't do it. So, <laughs> what's going to happen? So, he says, like this that's why he could know the rule is like this he may have sinned against Hashem in certain things, and also maybe something else. He didn't work hard enough in his panos because it says, how much. To understand the relationship between learning and Torah, between learning and earning, as they say. You have to say you've got to combine learning with earning. There are only special people who can be in such a position that learning alone works. In our days, it's easier than it's ever been. Yeah? You can also, but then you have, but then you have to work hard in your learning. If you work hard in your learning then often you'll see a bracha and you'll be able to manage in different ways. With even the Rambam, who's very strict in this matter, and he says that a person has to combine his learning with earning, but the first part of his life, although he became a great expert in many different areas of professions as well, because he was a brilliant mind, and he was a brilliant mastery of all the philosophies of his time, and all the medical research of his time, and he is on a fantastic high level. But he, he was supported by his brother. His brother was a merchant, and he supported him, like we find in the Gemara as well. The brother agreed to make an arrangement, he supported him non stop. Then, unfortunately, his brother died when he was um, on a business mission and sunk in the ship. Then he had to see, both things out himself. In any case, what, what does he say of the Tiberius Israel? He says an important thing. He quotes, it's really a pasuk, which the sages say means. It says, the man yivorechu Hashem, b'chol ma'ase yodachu Hashem ta'ase. It says, you will fill the Torah, then Hashem will bless you in the work of your hands that you do. Yochel, I might have thought, Hashem will bless you even if you don't do work. You've got to work honestly and strongly in your panasa. Don't make your panasa the ikr. Make your Torah the ikr. Panasa has got to be subsidiary. Take up less time and less thought. And then you'll be successful. Hashem said, you go ahead. You could olam kim in our no way. There's a principle we do not rely upon miracles. Hashem can make a miracle, but for that you've got to be in a very high level. To, the Shem should change what is predetermined. So, but if you do your part, then as a result, Hashem will bless you whatever you do. Now, let's just, that's the, let's go to the next state, because we dealt with Rabbi, we dealt with um, Rabbi Meir's opinion quite the time. So let's go or in previous year. The next opinion is Rabbi Shim ben Alazar. Can one of you say it? The Mishnah? What's Rabbi Shim ben Alazar say? Who? 
כל המשה וליבי דמשנה, רבשי מלעזר אומר. בצער. He said, did you ever see a, a, a beast or a bird who have a trade or profession? Don't see them making a business, setting up companies. Neither do you see them acting as lawyers or doctors. And they seem to have panasa without any pain. It's very easy for them. Yeah. They, they build their nests, but then afterwards they, uh, they get around. They find food, each one in his environment. This is the remarkable things about the animal world. There's so many different species and they all seem to manage to have enough in different ways. We know there are also uh, they're, 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 they're a beast. You know, they're, they're beasts become, why did it mention Behema? Why did it say Dafkechaya? Why not Behema? Can you, any of you tell me? Because what the, is a domestic animal that will be freed by his master? Yeah. Mm. That means once animals become domesticated, then there's some... Because domesticated means they, you don't let them go around wild. You put them in, a, in a, an enclosed situation, so really you are using them for human purposes more directly, and therefore it, it's also a tit for tat. As a result of the person that has domesticated animals, he knows the only way he can keep them out from the wild is if he provides them in his own home. If they're pets, he provides them with food constantly. But otherwise, wild cats, they get, uh, they, they can find their food. But once you domesticate <laughs> them, you, uh, they, uh, they're looked after by human beings. That's why it says, chayv off. I mean, the words of mission are very specific. And they don't have, they don't have to, don't have, they have it naturally. They have the nat All animals have a natural environment up to the extent that there are many animals and also birds, as you know, that they are, and also fish, the same situation, they change their colors and even their skin to some extent if they are in a, in a going to a different environment. In one environment they'll be green, next environment the alligators, they, they, do, they put on a different type of shell. Just protect them. It's all natural, part of nature. Nature is balanced and such. The balance of nature, you know, you know how it's described today, the balance of nature? A butterfly in Australia. You've heard about that? The wings of a butterfly in Australia can change the whole balance all over the natural environment in which we live, for the animal world. And why did Hashem create the animals? The Shamsheni, to serve me. Because that's what it says at the beginning of the Chumash. The animals are there to help human beings. Now I'm going to tell you this, this is a remarkable development in modern science. I don't know. Have you heard of the Apos... An anthropo, an, antro, anthropocentric universe. The anthropocentric globe. In other words, it's developing more in those who deal with the basics, basic pattern of the, science, of the discovery of science in the environment, that this globe demonstrates the production of the human being. That means the environment which is created, created specifically so that man will be served, like it says here, which is also the simple interpretation of, of the first chapter of the Chumash. And, what, and, who's, and why was I created? Why was man created? You know, that, that the scientists themselves, except the many philosophers of science, who say, yeah, so how do you explain man? If you find the principle of purpose in every level of nature, then surely there should be some purpose also in the human being. 
So that, that human being is there to serve Hashem. But there's a big difference in the animal world and the human world. What's the difference? What's the difference? The human beings don't serve Hashem automatically. That's right. The, oh, the, the animal world, if you go back to it, even the, even the vegetable world, the mineral world, they're all there, a chain reaction, to serve the human being, to develop this human being who's got the ability to, to reach a high level. But with the human being, it's not a robot effect. It's not the pre human being has a choice. Either to, to we see today, the human being's got the choice to preserve everything on this planet, <laughs> or the opposite, chas v'shalom. And today it's uh, become very, very serious, as we know. And I'm there to serve my Creator. So therefore the, the question is, if so, why shouldn't the human being be entirely free from having to do all menial things and to provide for our living? It should also be automatic. So that we can dedicate ourselves more to serve the Creator. So, what, so what's the answer to that? Is that why do why do human beings have a struggle for economic existence? That's the question. We, we, when when it, you see what you can see look like this, the the evolutionist theory went so far as to say since we know in human life there's a struggle for economic existence. Therefore, we also assume that who's most successful in the economic life? That's the one who struggles most for wealth and has the biggest abilities. So we have abilities and develops them to have as much wealth and possessions and success as possible. Some succeed and some fail. So the question is, what about the animals? The animals have it all naturally. So they say, oh no, no, the animals, all. the animals, it's, it's, it's worked backwards. We say, if there's struggle for economic existence, then it also demonstrates that previously all different species developed through a struggle for physical existence. And therefore they denied the more obvious development that the whole world is a design, designed by a divine mind, which is really the natural conclusion of anyone who studied science objectively. Because in the laboratory it's never been found that any species could be changed into a new species. No, not so. So there we see Hashem created in such a fashion. They don't have a struggle for economic existence. And also, they, don't, they did not have a struggle to develop into a new species. That's, that, that's, that's, a, that's an, an imaginary taking backwards the struggle for economic existence. And now, if you study, so anyone who studied really the development evolution from the Mar in the Marxist doctrine, the Marxist doctrine, which was, is I'm going to detail now, but it's built also upon the concept the human being is governed by the by the predetermined totalitarian system of the struggle for economics, mm -hmm. which is destroyed. Otherwise, no di no difference between the human being and also the development of one species to another. But the very one species never really took place because it's never been shown in a laboratory. There's a design, divine design. In fact, one of the greatest uh, um, uh, person who investigate evolution and the laws of chance. And he saw the laws of chance contradict the theory of evolution. So therefore, it's, it's Pierre de Noy was called. He wrote a book called uh, La Destinée Humaine, the de Human Destiny, which is one of the basic uh, the scientific books which changed a little, to a great extent the concept of the scientists and to accept there is a purpose in the world and there's a, there's a designer who designed the purpose. He had to admit it and to be, that's become more acceptable in many of the scientific world today. But this is the question here. If so, the question remains, why should the human being have a struggle for existence? So what's the answer? What's the original world which is described in the beginning of the Chumash? It's a Gan Eden. Gan Eden. The world could be a Gan Eden. What's the Gan Eden? And what did Hashem say to Adam and Chava? And you just have to cultivate the garden. You've got to make a garden where there's only peace and where there's love. 
and where there's the service of Hashem, where you can eat, where you can speak to Hashem, even at that level. But the condition is that if, if these words are used in the Midrash to describe it, I'm putting it in the garden, see to it, no tashchitu, don't destroy and corrupt this garden. So therefore the answer is given in the Mishnah. The Mishnah says, what, why do I have to work for Panasa? Because, can somebody read the Hebrew? Yeah. Come on, anyone, read the Hebrew. Or read it together. Come on, what's it say? Ela? Yeshodati Maasai. Maasai. What's that mean? Translate. Because my, my deeds became evil. I chose the evil in my actions. The Kipachti et Panasati. As a result, I don't have enough of a livelihood if I do nothing. Therefore, my panasa is difficult. And it's not easy for anyone to make ends meet. So, this, this, this is, this is the, the, um, the, the, the simple explanation of this phrase is, is because of the chet of Adam Arishon. And you can even say that to a certain extent the great satikim, some of them who don't have to struggle, like like Rashim ben Yochai, this discussion the Gemara for Am Yisrael. Those who dedicate themselves entirely to Torah, like Rashim ben Yochai and the Shita, they don't. They, they Hashem gives them what they need, and they don't need more. They don't have to struggle, or others help them. That like the tribe of Levi was intended to be like that. The tribe of Levi was intended to be free to do the service in the Beit HaMikdash and to teach Torah. Teach Torah also that the cities of the Levim, which are spread in last week's Pasha, were used even to educate people who were unfortunately bad slaughterers. They didn't respect life enough, so they had to teach them more qualities of self-control, how they should be careful of other people's life and limb. And the task of the Levim was to teach Torah. And the Rambam says, it's not only the Levim, but anyone in the world who wants to go in that path, then Hashem will provide him. He won't have to struggle. Thus, the Tzadikim are, as it were, in a Gan Eden in this world. And that's what we even say in the in, in the Rachaun Chayolana, Tzabotocheinu. Through Limut Torah, a person enters into developing the eternal spiritual aspect in his character, in his life, and Hashem will make it easier for him, in different ways, to be able to cope with the problems of a life of him and his family. But, but for Klal Israel as a whole, as Gemara says, we've got to follow the way of Rabbi Shmuel. To discussion of Rabbi Shmuel says, ordinary people, and the Gemara concludes like that. They are not on that high level, and therefore they've got to follow the man Yerecha Hashem Lukecha, or Masi Hot Chashatase. So that's 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 the simple explanation. <coughs> but um, but there are others who say that this it not it it doesn't only apply the statement of Shimonoza to the situation of all human beings. That's one, one way you can say. There's a, a the question is, does Rabbi Shimon ben Alatza disagree with Rabbi Meir, or does he agree with him? What's your opinion? Let's hear. Is Rabbi Shimon ben the same as Rabbi Meir, except he's expressing different words? Otherwise, does he also hold every father's got to teach his children almost to give a color, or does he disagree? Look, can you tell me? So look, now I'll, tell you. So I'll put it. I'll put the question a different way. I've given you the explanation given by many of the commentaries, from the Pnei Shua and others, and the and the Maral, who say that this statement Shimon Lord has got to do with the change of the nature of man from Adam and Chava in Gan Eden to human beings today being driven out of Gan Eden. And therefore, all human beings 
have to deal with the question of how to exist, how to have enough food, how to have livelihood. So according to that, it would appear that Rabbi as well you tell me, that's one opinion. There's another opinion that Rabbi Shimon is speaking about today. Since Chazal tell us a person should make in his life, he should make his main occupation, to put his mind in, to put his time in, should be uh, to learn Torah and to fulfill mitzvot of chesed, but to concern himself with his livelihood has got to take a secondary place in his life, in the plan for his life. And that's how he should approach marriage and children and family, you know, it's secondary. So the husband and wife have to know this is this is all secondary and then up to, to any situation of of difficulty we have in Panasa and don't let's make it a major aspect of our life, our lifestyle. So Khazal say Mishem Malakto Tafel, the Torah to Ikar, Hashem will bless him. But if someone changes it over and he makes most of his occupation to be with Panasa, with the livelihood, become richer, and he will put Torah by the side to be secondary, he's going in the wrong direction. So therefore, some say that's the extent. The Shimon Lozza is not speaking about Adam and Isham He's speaking about today, after they were dealing with halachot. So Rabbi Meir says the person, Le Olam, he says, the person's got to teach, Rabbi Meir Le Olam, always. The person must teach his son how to give a color, and it's got to add to filler to it. Yeah. You should know, you've got, you, you've got to have strong to filler, and to filler includes, as we said, lehit palel, to do tshuva, to change. If it's filler, it's just a filler. If you don't change your actions, it won't be effective. It's got to be a combination. So that's Rabbi Meir. Kamashim Meloda says, well, he says um, that we're dealing not with, with the Chet of Adam Arishon, but we're dealing with the, with the situation. A person's got to make the comparison. Uh, he should always make Malachto Ika and Malach Tavato Ika and Malachto Tefela. That's what he means. Since I was created today, I'm not speaking about other medishon, I was created to serve my Creator. Yeah? Therefore, I, surely I should be able to be given everything. The answer is my own actions are not good enough, and that's why. My panasa is too limited. If, if I, I've got to change, so therefore, what what he, what he's add, he's adding is according to which which interpretation would it make a difference? Is there enough coming if you interpret the first way or the second way? Can you tell me? First, any difference? First way, this is not uh, not our fault. Doesn't matter what you. Yeah. Do. Hmm? Yeah. And the second. It depends on you. It all depends on you. So the second one. Second. So yeah. Otherwise, I disagree with you, Rabbi Meir. You, Rabbi Meir. Everybody's got to teach his children. But what happens if his children recognize that the main thing in life is Torah, and uh, they always make it a priority, and they always make panasa just the secondary aspect. Then, they, um, they, can, so they can often, they don't have to follow an umnos. They can rely on it. Like we see, actually, in the laws of the Torah. It's to some extent, the machloket between Rabbi Ishmael and Rabbi Shimon Yuchai. And as the Gemara says, there are many people try to do like Rabbi Shimon ben Yochai were unsuccessful. But those who followed the view of Rabbi Shimon were successful. In other words, what he's saying here is, there can be exceptions. Not like you, Rabbi Meir, say everybody has to. No, there can be exceptions. Because if a person, he constantly makes Torah the priority, 
to the extent that he, he, he even is at such a high level that he's able to serve his creator completely, then Hashem takes away the necessity for him earning his parnasa. Hashem will give him what he needs. Depends a person on the Madrega where he's, he's not on the Vega of Hashem Yochai. But some individuals can reach that Madrega. As we see in the Torah also, the difference between Yisachar and Zavulon, where we know Yisachar, to a made a partnership, Yisachar dedicated himself to the Torah, most of the tribe, as it says in Tivra Yamim, that Yisachar dedicated himself almost entirely to studying Torah, and that's why they were the great experts also in aspects of understanding astronomy, which is so necessary for understanding the Torah. And it's hinted at in the blessing already of Moshe Rabbeinu. Zavulam were businessmen. And therefore, they, they dedicated their business, to the, most of the time was spent in business, but they used their business to support Torah. And some would use, that's why it's a maximum bit setecha, bisachab olecha. Use Yisachar, I know you go out to do business. And you might say, well, I'm doing business all the time, so I'm, so I'm not having a spiritual life. Or even you had the example of the Rambam's brother. The Rambam's brother could not reach the level of the Rambam. And he knew to start with. He'd be given, he, he'd be given great understanding of doing business in, in the jewel, jewelry trade, the diamond trade. You know, Jews, Jews are good at that until today. Mm -hmm. so, he, so, so, so he he had the schutz. And the Gemara speaks also, Shimon Achiazaria, that if a brother or a brother tribe helps. And even today, people make partnerships. Bus big businessmen, they make partnerships, even write documents of partnership. They support Talmud Chachamim. Why, why today we have, Baruch Hashem, fortunate situation of thousands of talented young people dedicating all their time to learning Torah and teaching it. So there's enormous flourishing of Torah in our time. It's also because they're businessmen most of their time is spent in the business. They become richer, and they, they, but they dedicated, they help the coin and to help the yeshiva, and they get the same sakhait as an olamaba. They will be given the ability to have knowledge of Torah according to the amount of people and their level of learning that they supported. They'll have, they'll have the same level of learning. It's given to them because they have a, they, it's a partnership. So I think that's what that's what Rabbi, Rabbi Shimon ben El Azar is hinting at here. So therefore, a person who recognizes that all I have to I have to dedicate myself entirely to Hashem, then he will not have to take time off to be concerned about his livelihood. So let's say today we've got uh, such great giants of Torah, Chaim uh, Kalevsky. Hashem, who, um, who uh, they, they don't bother much about their livelihood. You know, because no Steinman's house in the, you know, doesn't spend uh, a cent on improving his his his, his apartment. But uh, at the same time, he's uh, constantly told mind and heart are given over to learn and teach Torah and give chizuk. So it's, this is the schus that we have in our time, that we do have people who are following the pattern of Shevet Levi, and that's what's emphasized here by Shem ben So this, the, the, I think this is the difference of opinion. If you look at, if you look, if you explain like many of the commentators were dealing with Adam before the Chet and after the Chet, then it becomes a universal problem and to, in our time. And we, we've, lo we've lost it. But the, but the other concept is, no, the halacha la is really arguing with Rav Meir. Rav Meir says everyone has to do it, because you can't take a chance. But it says, as it says, pick a vot. If, if, if it lets a person who can't make ends meet, most, most Jews will find that as a result, they might they, they lose their faith in Hashem, or they lose also their, their, their dedication to mitzvah, because it's and our size is so difficult.
So now I want to tell you a beautiful word. It says here, birds don't have to run around for their livelihood. They have got it in their environment to receive all the pigeons here and other birds. So um, I want to tell you about it. It's like this, the Chumash, even the Tzanach, as we know, it's great significance to similar wording, similar key words, and also key phrases. And since uh, I think many of you know the song we sing on Shabbos, called Yoy no Motze Boy Yeah? You know it? And if you know good Nibun for it, good sing. What's that mean? The Yoy no Motze Boy What's it refer to? The dove found on it rests. The Shom Yanuch, in all those who are tired, they're tired out, they find a good rest. What's it referred to, that phrase? Can you tell me? To the worker who has toiled the whole week and will find a rest for his body and his spirit. So who's the Yoyna? From Israel. Human being. Mentioned yeah, the Yoyna, which, which, uh, which brought the olive leaves. <coughs> Yeah, found them after the deluge, is a symbol for who? Am Israel. Am Israel compared to Yoin in quite a few places, especially in Shir but also in many places in the Tanakh. Shir Yeah, also refers to the people of Israel as the Tav. And we all know the Tavs have certain beautiful qualities, as you will notice here on the Shiva, or the um, now we have the, you know, there's a this huge dovecot opposite in, in the in the in the Yair Shalahim. and you know they and they go all in the area to pick up bits of bread and other things, and they're very peaceful. You generally find that you know they don't they don't interfere with other birds or other situations. They they fly from one place to another, and that's why they feed themselves, build their nests, and where they're very loving to one another. So the Yoino is a symbol of peace, you know, shows that the world is not destroyed, there's still olive, olive leaves around. So the Yoino is a symbol for the people of Israel. And when it says, it says, In the first release of the dove, I haven't got a watch, you must tell me it's five to one. No, it's ten. Ten to one, so it's yeah, good then. In, in the, in the first search of the Yoino after the deluge for trees, how did it come back? It came back with nothing. Yeah. The second search, it came back with olive leaves. So the verb, what's the verse in the Chumash? The, the, the uh, Yoino did not find any peace for its feet. So that goes in the song the people of Israel are compared to those who really want to spread peace in the world. And our whole, very, very applicable today, today when the world is being threatened from a mabo, uh, such a confusion of values amongst the wider parts of mankind, and it's endangering all life on this planet. So who can bring the message of peace? People of Israel. We say peace to everyone, that's all we want, we want peace. We only believe in having an army, according to the rules, we have to protect ourselves against murderers. That's it, the protection, it's Sahal, it's So, it's, so and we, we want peace in the whole world, we need it. So today the world is a global village and any great danger, explosion affects every bit of life on this planet. And therefore, we have to go ahead with our message of peace. In the right, and the peace going to be achieved. We're not cut into pieces. That's part of the principle. You comes to kill you, you you have to have to remove murderers. But this is message of peace. But when you speak in the in the meters of Shabbos, what do we refer to when we say, and there will be will be at rest those 
who are tied out. What's it referred to? <coughs> but what's the Sham Yenuch Yikikoach referred to? It is made of Shabbos. What's it referred to, simply speaking? Shabbos rest. Shabbos rest. We have the Shabbos, which brings a rest to all Am, Am Israel. Because the Shabbos is, is that which Shabbat Shalom. Shabbos is that which creates peace in the struggle for economic existence. And on Shabbos, whether you're poor or rich, makes no difference. Shabbos, you stop in the rat race to become richer, and also you stop being worried about not having enough, because you can always have enough. You can always find people. But in a way, Shabbos is the day of rest for every Jew. So that's, the, that's in the song. Now, it, where else do we find this phrase? The, there's a Masora, you find it often brought to Balaturim, where it brings a similar phrase. It says, uh, the phrase is, and if you know, right. yeah, the phrase is that uh, you say, There's a situation when a person has to pay up a debt. And then it says, what's happened if his mind did not find enough, his, 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 his power did not have enough money to return what he owes? That's another time where we find the word motzo. And the third time we find it, the bird finds its nest, finds its home. And therefore, this is brought in Tehillim, a David Amelech, to express how we as come to Hashem and we see, we pray to Hashem, we should have our home. We want back our home of Eretz Israel, the Beit Hamikdash. So, therefore, the beautiful explanation is to connect these three phrases. Lo matzai na'amor kafalavlo. Knesset Yisrael have no rest. We're constantly worried about our economic existence as individuals and even as a nation. We're all concerned here, in, here also. There's so many, so many people under the level of poverty and we have to work for it. It's a big problem. But we say, We know that even the birds, they, they have their nest. They always find their home. So they have easy panasa, and they sit in security in their nests, in their houses. So why do we live a life of pain as individuals, as a nation? So the answer is, Shadotes Maasai, if we would do teshuva and be like the Yona, to do without sin and be close to Hashem, then they keep the Shabbos, according to this song, if we all Amish will keep the Shabbos, it will change our whole attitude to all our problems which have their roots in uh, ha having to, they say here, to be able to be able to pay our debts and to keep away from the enormous struggles of life, to feel at home with Hashem. Only three times that's enough this phrase goes, Motsa. Okay. Now please, I would like you to, to, to continue to study the Mishnah up to the end. You know, you've got plenty of English translations with the art scroll, by the Gomorrah, or, or with Mishnahis, so that um, we can go more deeply and to the deep lessons found in the remainder of this Mishnah. Yeah. Uh, is there question? time for a question? Yeah, there's time for a question. Yes? Okay. That's just, uh, what time is the, it? Uh, it's about five to one. Okay. Um, <clears throat> did the, does it guarantee in the Homish Hashem who says, I guarantee you, if you give Sadaka, you'll be rich. So that must not be, hmm? must be, must be not so on a simple level. Right? What does that mean? If you give Sadaka, you'll be rich. 
Aser b'shvil shitit asher. You got to give a tithe of your income so that you become rich. That's that is. I mean, there are many millionaires who state this. Other they began poor, but they gave a tenth, and as a result, they became rich. It's it's a. Even Hashem says in his last words of his last prophet, he says, there's one area in life where you're allowed to test me. Don't test me and say, well, if I keep everything, Hashem will help me. But with charity, he says, yeah, but Hanun el It says, if you will test me with charity and you always give a tenth, uh, if, if, if even permitted to give up to a fifth, but they should at least give a tenth of whatever you're earning, give it to charity. And then you'll see, you'll get, you'll get richer. You'll get even more. And the, uh, there's even the, the examples brought in the Midrash on that Pasuk, Asher Mishmitzit Asher. You also see the word Osher, it's connected with Asher. Asher is a tenth, yeah? and Osher means to be rich. Because the concept of the tenth is to combine your action with Hashem's power, which is expressed through the ten. The ten words in which the world was created, the ten makot, and the ten declarations of the Aseda Tadibrod. If you want to enter that realm of, com of completion, represented by the ten, it's also the completion of human beings, represented by his ten fingers, ten toes, the Eses then give one tenth to connect your giving with coming nearer to Hashem, and you'll respond. That's why we say to shuv with filut tzedaka. Tzedaka has to be added to, to the main essence of shuv, from which to get blessing, is to give to others. And let's say you've got no money at all, then, but you've got a bit of learning, give a tenth of your time for others. Yeah. Tenth of the time. That's why the poskim say, today there's some people who don't have enough to eat, they don't have enough of anything, Therefore, they really the, the, the law is if they don't have to eat, then they even with panes minat staka. You know they, they they can't give at all because they are constantly in debt. Then give one tenth of your time to learn with those who don't don't know something that you do know. They learn with them. That's the minimum you have to give tenth of what you possess. If you have no physical possessions, then give your learning possessions to others. I very much appreciate to give interpretations on this mission of which you have seen or which you've thought about. This mission? This mission. Review it? Yeah, go on with it. There's a lot more in this mission. Sorry for being a little bit late. Huh? I apologize for being late. Sorry. Thanks. Tomorrow, have a lesson? Huh? Tomorrow, have a lesson? Ken, come back up.